or transfer to improve performance of plants and animals. Please, how I know that? However, on how this happens, they do not know. They don't even understand what genes are. They thought that a ordinary tomato would not have genes, and a GMO tomato would have genes. Of course, living or all living all their organisms would have genes. Another one, in terms of surrounding controversy, because I think they are all well read, and this is a requirement of their job, they knew you know, all along that this is a very controversial technology, and primarily on the basis of health and safety risks. And they know that it is being contested uh, worldwide, not only in the Philippines. So for them, it's very controversial. In terms of the perceived value, we're quite positive on this. They, they appreciate the value of the biotechnology for improving life. In fact, they see it as inevitable to help address food security for them. Any technologies must be maximized, but of course there are some proposals later. And they also believe that being part of science, no technology can guarantee zero risk. In terms of the regulation aspect, this is their job, this is the role where I think they will have a, a significant uh, contribution to later on. They believe that applications of agrobiotech are not properly regulated in the country. Though they are familiar with some laws and the NCBP, the existence of the uh, body, they feel that the agrobiotech is not, uh, or agrobiotech applications are not properly regulated in the Philippines. They perceive, and they have very strong perception about this, that large agricultural and multinational companies are the ones benefiting from agrobiotech applications in the Philippines. <coughs> now, we also ask them what they think are products of uh, agrobiotech. They, they, they identify, of course, beauty corn, golden rice, GM wheat, GM mosquito, and GM tilapia. I didn't even know about this GM things before, no? But of course, I don't think it would be would say that some of these are not necessarily biotech products because some involve some genetic editing. I'm not a scientist, as this to the scientists later, no? But these were the items that they identified. Also, Surprisingly, they identify the chickens being fed with hormones as part of biotech, uh, including also the Washington Industrial Peanut and the placenta soap for anti-aging or skin whitening. Of course, all those colored uh, orange are not, but, but on the basis of our scientific definition, are not really part of a group biotech. About familiarity with those related to agrobiotech, they have named about nine of them. And as I've said, and as I've mentioned earlier, they're more akin to the intellectual property code. While they're aware of National Com Committee on Biosafety in the Philippines, they're not very well aware of the composition. Also in the Philippines, plant variety, the practitioners in the group uh, were familiar with this. Of course, the other ones would be the Cartagena Protocol, Convention on Bi Biological Diversity, the DAO, the old, I think it's called the old DAO, and the Freedom of Information. Now, what influenced the lawyers' ideas about agribiotech technology? You know, many do be their practice. So, most of the time, they watch TV programs like History and Discovery Channel, National Geographic, the BBC, and the CNN. They don't watch robot programs. Um, unfortunately, and I'm going to show it later, some of these TV programs are already showing fiction science stories. So I think this is one of the challenges that we're going to mention a little later. And I think we should be happy. In terms of journal articles, they're accessing UPLP and BPI uh, materials. While we think th these are not for them because, of course, these are very technical, they actually find efforts to look for materials from UPLB, believing that this is the most credible institution in the country to work on biotech because it has the mandate and the, um, the full accountability for its work. Of course, they, they are very techy. They use Google search and they mention some applications. And one thing also is that they're very curious about food labels. 
Now, many of them were, you know, every time they buy this processed product, they look, they read intently on the food labels. Because for them, this is a source of information about, you know, are this food processed, you will see the GMOs, etc. And they appreciate seminars and fora. In fact, they mentioned that these are the venues where they think they're getting the most ideas because they can interact with the experts. And at some point, when they do patenting work, they have to talk with their clients who are involved in agricultural product uh, development because sometimes they don't know the technical terms that they are using. In fact, when they appreciate the journal articles, they said that the materials are to take it from them, for them. In fact, they mentioned the word nosebleed. <laughs> so what are the challenges? And this we try to select from the study. They would actually refer to the lawyers' encounters and sources of information that do not always lead to clarifying agrobiotech and even lead to the building up of misconceptions about agrobiotech. So what are these challenges? One, low engagement in agrobiotech, agrobiotech development. Three fourths have not been engaged at all in any related biotech cases, and I think that's expected. And for those who were involved, two of them were involved in the BT Tello case one as a litigation partner from Manila, and one as a doctor of cyst and disease order in Davao. So, both sides, huh? Also, another challenge is they tend to get lost in the jargon, you know, where while they are practicing to the due diligence and they are actually wide and voracious readers, they hardly understand the jargons of the policies they read related to agriculture and to biotech. In fact, they suggested that if, uh, because they are getting the tickets mostly from UPLB, if we are kind enough to do laymanized summaries for them in the future. So, it has a great bearing on their role because without clear understanding, they said that how can we spot the issues and their implications and finally take a step. Now, the, the lawyers are just like us. They are just human beings. Uh, they're also, they are also vulnerable to some needs. They go to beauty parlors because many of them are actually females. So these are some of the myths and the influencers of these myths. Uh, to be well and beautiful, GM foods are a big no-no. Though, you know, in general, they don't accept, it, accept that uh, statement. Somehow it has some subliminal effect on them. They said so. And this came from beauty and wellness seminars and from the beauty parlors. So I think we should also invade the beauty parlors. <laughs> Uh, also, they have, they have this, this myth no, that cancer and autoimmune diseases are brought about by processed or GM foods. And they get this from Facebook ads on organic foods. Of course, they're selling organic foods, so they're going to say other things about GM foods. Now, another myth that natural food is an alter, thus they are safer for babies, for GM foods. Many lawyers have children. Once. And therefore, they're very conscious about the food that they feed to the babies. So whenever they have these friends, relatives, or mothers like them, they listen to their stories and somehow they get affected and influenced. And there are these lawyers who are involved in the uh, banana industry in Davao. They said that based on their observations, it seems that if some good trades in crops are lost using agrified technology, Somehow, there are trade-offs. The bananas might look good, but they're not sweet anymore. So this means, uh, I'm sure, are still prevailing, and perhaps this would give us better ideas on how we're going to handle the misconceptions. Now, as I've said, they're watching uh, National Geographic and Discovery Channel. And therefore, they're getting, and they have admitted that they're watching pseudo scientific or science science fiction programs. I have not watched any of this, but uh, as I reviewed some, uh, I think that pseudo-scientific programs are quite alarming because they actually show some, because it's, it's fiction, no? They're trying to show some 
monsters are unbelievable possibilities to try to invent and develop more technologies. And in fact, they thought that, and they feared that we can reach a point when we don't regulate our inventions, including agrobiotech, we might come to a point where Captain America might give birth to Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah, I quoted them, this is where exactly their words. And there are also victims of misleading food labels and advertisements, and we call this greenwashing in uh, environmental form. When you know a lot of products would claim that they are actually uh, natural, but in fact, it's very obvious they are processed. You know, your chippy and your potatoes, uh, they will claim that these are natural, it's very obvious they have been processed, no? So everything that's, uh, that would attract the, uh, the consumers, particularly the big ones who are inclined to be more uh, into organic kind of product, would look for the label all natural in the tagline without understanding you know, what that means. And of course, those labels would insinuate that key and foods are bad products. Now, what are the sources, sources of information you know, that are also at the same time inaccessible to them? Uh, they mentioned are in institutions like Kiri and BPI, but rarely do they uh, access information. Government specialists and experts, they believe in them, but could hardly be accessed. Of course, UPLB was uh, to them uh, credible, but they said they hardly access the materials also. Uh, I don't know if they're, they're, they're using our journals and they're using those that are online only. They don't have time to come here and buy our materials. That's for the academy. For the scientific, they, they, they have much respect for scientific journals that are peer-reviewed. They have what it's not qualified that they're looking for those which are peer-reviewed. But in terms of regulatory body, which is the National Industry Council, they find this to be readily accessible to them, and the Google Scholar. These are actually credible, the red ones are the credible and accessible sources for them. The rest are inaccessible. Okay, uh, when we try to ask about the attitude, in general they favor the use of agrobiotech, but they're very explicit about their precautions. Uh, very strongly they said these have to be regulated. Just like medicines, they said that you know, medicines are good to a certain extent. You have to observe the level of use of medicines. So for them, there must also be some uh, level of use for agribiotech. Uh, so regulations about that. Then, for public to appreciate that, they feel that a certification set from the government being a credible source, saying that these are absolutely safe, should come about, and this somehow contradicts the earlier statement that, you know, agribiotech, just like any science, cannot uh, uh, assure us a zero risk. Risks should be addressed, public should be educated about it, and they're very emphatic about pros and cons. In fact, they thought that somehow there is an effort to deliberately tone down the disadvantages about agrobiotech. And they also suggested to focus more on level of use, just like medicines, no? They said, you know, it's good. And also the junk foods. It, it's okay to eat junk foods, eat medicines, but you know, you have to do it in moderation. And one very strong word from them is to leave out the multinational companies in the process. I don't know how come that is possible. They're really very suspicious about the multinational companies. To them, the bottom line for all of these companies would really be profit, no matter how much denial uh, they do. Okay, the bigger challenge would be this. While in general, they perceive agrobiotech as an interesting topic, we do not find it as a lucrative area of legal practice as yet just like the drugs. In fact, this is going to be a big challenge. Uh, Tamsel is a lawyer, so I was asking him, how do lawyers look at, you know, money from their profession? And then the lawyers, the 
themselves actually were very honest with us. They said, you know, legal profession is a very tough job. It takes a long time, we invested a lot of time. So if it's not going to be as lucrative as the other areas of practice, we have a big challenge to face. So what are the prospects if we have these challenges? Uh, what are the, the, the good possibilities? So when I say prospects, this would refer to activities, mechanisms, and measures that may be undertaken to help clarify our activity tech and enhance the lawyer's engagement in its development and applications in the country. One, there's a prospect, and, that, and this is one thing they expect from the science community, that we give them full disclosure, disclosure regarding activity tech. Uh, this is actually quoted from their um, statements. Whether or not scientists are protecting the intellectual property right or commercial value of the research, full disclosure about the pros and cons of how we buy technology is still wanting. For drugs and medicines, both the cure and side effects are disclosed, and yet the public still buys them. So the same should work for how we buy tech. On the labeling of agri-biotech products. Therefore, this agri-biotech products may adopt the labeling being used for foods and medicines. Ingredients and nutritional facts are important for consumers to make informed decisions. Because lawyers are they actually working for people's rights and safety. Then, GM products are quite difficult to distinguish from non-GM ones. When you go to the groceries, you don't know which ones are GM and not. So labels can help differentiate. So protection of people's right to information and choice for their protection and safety is of prime concern to lawyers. Partnerships between scientists and lawyers. Uh, this is actually a, a light for us, finally. Scientists may remain to be in the front line of developing the technology, while lawyers can guide the public on what can be done or what cannot be done with the technology. For them, scientists just invent, and it is the lawyers who should be able to say, what are you going to do with these technologies? So certain people's rights should have been reviewed also at the start of the process, and not wait until the entire process is done, because they felt that this was what happened with our GMOs. Then, this is also a quote from them, scientists may be clueless about legalities, and lawyers about how science works. So then the two complement each other. So they're very willing to partner with the scientists, with the science community. Also, they feel that there should be lawyers with biotech expertise. Um, lawyers see the value of developing biotechnical experts in their profession who will serve as meat busters on the topic. Uh, unfortunately, they have less preference for scientists talking to them about biotech. <laughs> They said that, you know, if uh, you bring in a scientist talking to lawyers, he would have less credibility. And it would be difficult for him to permeate the circle of using the lingo also of the lawyers themselves. So if we are to tread new ground like Abby Biotech, let's build up lawyer uh, communicators about Abby Biotech. Then they're willing to integrate, and this is a good possibility, a good prospect, to integrate public biotech and lawyers education because they have this uh, mandatory continuing legal education program and they're willing to propose that agri biotech may be included as a subject. It can form part of their 36 required units every year, which is the NCLE, and because this is required of their continuous practice. So I think this is going to be quite sustainable. Another possibility would be to have uh, a topic on agrobiotech in the existing subjects already in their law curriculum, which could fall under intellectual property or environmental law subjects. They feel that the topic on biotech may not be too big to merit a separate subject, a three unit subject in their curriculum. Then they're willing to take up short courses about the topic, and they're willing to observe have field trips and study tours at IRI, UPLB, BPI, and other agencies. They're actually very uh, excited to have this 
they said they were asking, when are we going to have this? I said, I don't know yet, but perhaps this will be considered by the funding agency. And they're willing to have scholars on agribiotech, even if they're already not what, 45 years old. They're willing to pursue another PhD or MA or MS. So there are things that lawyers are very willing to do. They're willing to learn about science and not leave everything to the scientists. They're even arguing about our concept of truth, of truth. To them, truth is absolute. Whereas they say in science, there are always probabilities, degree of error, etc. So we differ to some extent in terms of how we look at quote and quote truth. They're also willing to attend sessions, participate in sponsored study groups, as I've said. They are willing to pay for extra core cost of labeling GM foods because they believe in the people's freedom of choice and they are willing to be funded, they are willing to do some policy studies uh, concerning disclosure, labeling, regulatory bodies on biotech, and the biotech in particular, and participate uh, in regulating biotech and not be into that industry. So what is the bigger prospect then? We are proposing to expand agri biotech involvement of lawyers beyond funding cases. We can work out greater understanding and involvement of lawyers in governance and regulation of agri biotech. In fact, they're willing to be part of the entire process from start to finish, as long as there is a, a, a clear formality to burning that arrangement. So I think that's all on my part. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. You can just imagine this is the most nerve-wracking presentation of my life. If you have to deliver something right after your mother gives a presentation, that's <laughs> gonna be a, a lot of pressure. Um, but I'm uh, thankful for everyone here today, and I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge like, Professor Edmund Centeno, who's part of the team who actually did this uh, study with us. Um, the part that I will present to you uh, is actually not largely my uh, work. Um, I, I think the better person to uh, present this to you is Professor Elaine Larena, but unfortunately, she is out of the country uh, completing her PhD. So uh, I hope uh, I can do justice to, to what we have come up with so far. So this presentation is, I would say, um, more, it's less exciting than what you, than what you heard earlier. Uh, why? Because, uh, the previous study we just heard about uh, focused on the views of lawyers who are practicing. So the legal profession is composed of lawyers and there are many different roles and tasks and positions that lawyers um, take. And so most of the respondents in the FGDs and the survey uh, were the practitioners and from what you've seen, these are the younger ones. No? So what I present to you are um, the views as expressed in legal documents uh, written ex or that shows um, the views of an older set of lawyers. So these are views of justices, appointed justices of the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. So just uh, based on that uh, background, you can imagine uh, the context that they're coming from and the perspective that they carry with them as people who are much more mature in the legal profession and therefore also uh, perhaps during their time, they're not as exposed to all these new technologies, including agribiotech. So I'll give you just a brief uh, rundown of uh, the study. It's uh, quite a long one, but I'll be presenting to you uh, the highlights. So I think the background has been explained earlier by Dave, but I'd like to emphasize a few parts that will show us um, the basis or where we got the documents. So uh, the study that was presented earlier in this one was largely a product of uh, the very contentious uh, BT Talong case no, that uh, started in well, 2010 was uh, the year when the tests began. And then it was in 2012 that the petitions were filed. And I think we're familiar, it was Greenpeace and another group, Masipag, plus individuals who are representing themselves as uh, taxpayers and ordinary citizens who will be affected. Um, it was in 2013 when the first ruling 
was issued. So some of you might ask, if the, the petitions were actually filed in the Supreme Court based on our um, rules on environmental cases. But uh, the Supreme Court remanded it to the Court of Appeals so that the Court of Appeals can um, receive facts because in the Supreme Court, only issues of law are tackled. So the CA sided with Greenpeace and the other petitioners and actually uh, stopped the field trials. But of course, we don't, UPLD and all the other um, agencies uh, who were respondents to the case uh, did take that sitting down. The case was uh, appealed on certiorari to the Supreme Court. And in 2015, unfortunately, the initial decision of the Supreme Court, so there's one long, really long decision um, of the Supreme Court saying that the the old Department of Administrative Order in 2002, which was the basis for the issuance of the permit for the field trial, was not employed. Therefore, the trial should have stopped. But by that time, the trials were already done. And they also, the Supreme Court at that time also temporarily suspended the issuance of new applications for permits. So that caused a lot of uh, alarm and concern, not just among scientists, but also uh, those in the agriculture uh, industry who were working on um, biotechnology products in GM. So, but uh, fortunately, after a lot of issues in 2016, the Supreme Court reversed itself. Surprisingly, but not really surprisingly, there are many instances where the Supreme Court does that, and it said that they should not really have decided this case at all because it's moot and academic because the field trials were already done by the time the case reached the Supreme Court. And, but by that time, the issue about the validity or of DAO-8 was also moot because by then, a new Joint Department Circular 2016 had already been issued. So that's essentially the whole telenovela of this digital case. So wh why has this... Uh, issue of understanding lawyers' perspectives about science, um, critical. Uh, why, why was it raised after we witnessed how the BT Talong case was resolved? So if we look at the original petition filed by Greenpeace, uh, they, of course, just like any petition, alleged a lot of um, issues. And we can categorize the issues that they raised into two. So the first group would be mostly the legal and procedural issues. So, so did the agencies, of the VA, DNR, comply with their mandate and the requirements of the policy? So they were raising if there has to be an ECC, there has to be consultations, meaningful ones at that with the communities involved, following the local government code, uh, and the other ones at the bottom, the three ones, legal standing, mootness, nothing. These are really just legal procedural issues that were resolved at the Court of Appeals. But the more, more important and more substantive issue they raised, the Greek peace and al raised, was the issue of harm. They're saying that the field trials must be stopped, not only because they did not comply with the legalities that they mentioned, but more because of the issue of lack of proof of safety. So they cited all these uh, references to BD Corn's harmful effect on rats, in another country, even if BD Talong was the subject, then they had all these issues about the effects of BD Talong, non-target species, and so on. So all these, I'm not a scientist, so I don't think I'm the best person to explain this to you, but just from the petition, these are among the issues that, if you come to think about it, these science-based, more substantive issues are things that cannot be resolved by just interpretation of the law alone. Right? So, because of that, the BDTALO case actually surface a very practical interface of law and science. Although this is not the first time for law and science to actually uh, be enmeshed together, but this one was very practical for not just the scientists, but many Filipinos. Because Talong is such a staple in the Filipino household. Right? So, th this is something that has uh, caused concern to a greater number of people from the public. So the interface has heightened even because of these types of uh, reporting. So it's taking down science. So it's like the law versus science. It's like the 
lawyers not understanding science and a dark day for science. So it, it's that interface that gives us the impetus, the imperative to actually understand how can law and science actually complement each other. So for our study, our focus was really simply to analyze how science was reflected in court documents related to the big data case. So I already related to you the different um, stages of that case. No? So in, in trying to achieve this objective, we focused on three um, research questions. So we looked at the primary elements of science-related legal arguments. As I mentioned to you, um, like the 2015 decision was more than 170 pages. And uh, it contained a lot of legal arguments. We did not consider all the arguments, all legal arguments, but we looked at those that relate to science. The other question we tried to answer, what were the context of the justices' inquiries to scientists during the Court of Appeals hot tub discussion? And what's this hot tub discussion? If I may go back to our telenovela earlier, so when the case was remanded to the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals' task was to look into the facts to make a determination of the important available information in order to resolve the case. And because this issue is such uh, a complex one, the Court of Appeals tried a new method or system of ascertaining facts from witnesses. I think some of you are, or many of you are familiar with the regular um, courtroom scenario where you have a witness on the stand and then the uh, lawyer will ask questions. And on direct examination, you cannot ask leading questions, right? You always have to lay the basis. It has to be a very logical, methodical process of questioning. That was supposed to be the case. That's also applied generally in the court of appeals. But for this one, they thought if they do that, they might not be able to get to the heart of the issues because you can't just ask any question you can take of your mind. So, and the judge, and it will be up to the lawyers to ask the question. So the justice thought we should try a different way that will allow us to probe more deeply into the issues involved. And that's what they did. That's why they resorted, they resorted to the hot tub method. What's a hot tub? They weren't in a sauna, but they uh, had, it's like an FGD of some sort, with the justices themselves asking questions and also facilitating. So it's like anything goes. And then you can ask, and then the experts will be brought in by the respondents or the petitioners in this group and then the group of UP and then they will uh, ask uh, the judges to ask and they will answer. So it's, it's uh, a long discussion and we looked at the transcripts of the, uh, the hot tub discussions and tried to understand the context of the inquiries. And then the third question that we tried to answer is what are the emerging science related themes? in the decisions of the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. So here, uh, we try to distinguish which arguments are science-based or science-related and which are purely legal. So uh, we consider the science-related arguments as those with reference to or relying on principles or explanations based on empirical data. So if it's purely law, precedents, legal texts, that are needed to make an interpretation or to make a resolution, then we consider that as a purely legal issue. Okay? So how did we try to do that? It, this is basically a mixed approach content analysis. So it's really just uh, understanding the documents. That's why you will notice that most of our slides are very verbose. Um, there, it's really a lot of uh, textual analysis. So what did we analyze? Just these four key documents. So you will notice that the documents we look at are largely decisions. Decisions are the public issuances of the Court of Appeals giving finality or an end to a case at least on their level. So we look at the Court of Appeals decision, the 2015 decision of the Supreme Court, and then the 2016 decision when they reverse themselves, including the concurring opinions. So there are justices who agree with the opinion, with the final result, but they have a separate explanation. So we also looked at that. And apart from those decisions, we also looked at as a very important, and because it's also unique to the Vigita Long case, the transcript of stenographic notes of the hot club discussion. 
So that, that was a very rich source of uh, data for us because that's like a raw discussion. Because the, the decisions, these are, well, they have, justices have to formulate it following a particular format. This is in a public uh, form, so they have to use the words carefully. So it's it's really the, the decision and the ESM together really gives us very good material to, to analyze for the document review. So for the decisions, um, Professor Lorena uh, proposed this model to use the two means model of argumentation. We just selected some of the science-based arguments and then the, for the TSM, we did some tabular organization. So there's a, some counting of the frequency of how often a certain theme um, surfaces. So this is just a quick view of the Tomins model. It's essentially looking at what's the claim, what's the basis of the claim, and that's what's the explanation. So that's essentially the basis of the study. So, but uh, just a caveat, so this study is very limited because it's just looking at the content of the documents that I told you about. So it's not really a discourse analysis because we're looking at just one side. It's not how the lawyers responded to the justices, but just how the justices think. It's not an assessment of the legal correctness. We're not here to say they were thinking very wrongly, or it's not uh, their their reasoning is not justifiable. So that's not the point of this. Um, and the decisions of the documents that we look at, the decision and the TSM, the content of these documents are based on the framing of issues and presentation of facts. And that's, I think, one important um, caveat that we have to emphasize because Whenever we look at legal documents, they're not open treatises. I mean, they, they, you can't just write whatever you want. It depends on how the issues were presented and framed, and you respond to that. So it's the same thing I showed you earlier, the issues that Greenpeace presented. So the court also had to respond to the way these issues have been framed. And then, as I said also, these of the other members of the legal profession, the practicing lawyers, who were very active in the case, are not included in the study. And of course, since this is just focused on the Vidita Law case, there are other science-related um, cases that were brought to the Supreme Court, the Manila Bay, Clean Up, the, some mining cases, um, and uh, others have already noted how liberal the courts have been in these types of cases. So it really presents a different. So what are our findings just from the decision? So, so many are the, many of the uh, arguments within the main decisions that we looked at focus on the legal issues. But the two key arguments that uh, we found that were actually expounded on not in the main decisions but in the concurring opinions because it's in the concurring opinions of Justice Velasco and Justice Yone in the 2015 Supreme Court decision said there was more substantive discussion related to science. And so in the first argument that was apparent in the way the Supreme Court was trying to reason based on the concurring opinion is that there seems to be a dichotomy between applying the legal rules and having a scientific, uh, an appreciation of scientific evidence. Because the thing with the Vita Law case is the idea that it's still a field trial and therefore there is yet no certainty as to the effects, as to the safety for consumption that the justices were trying to find out. So here, in the first argument, the court was saying the legal grounds are sufficient in the petition in order for them to make a determination without actually making a determination as to the harm or not that can be uh, produced by the field testing. So this one is seemingly uh, a red, not really a red flag, but it's an idea for us to seriously consider because if the thinking of lawyers or justices in this case is to separate science from the law, then uh, I think that that can uh, be somehow useful but at the same time dangerous. Because I think what the BD the law case shows us is that science and law must complement each other so that they are able to enrich the discourse and discussion about critical issues that involve people. And so but the thinking here is we have to separate it. So 
it's but it has its practical use for justices because they know that when it comes to matters of science, they do not have expertise on that. And that's largely the reason why they want to try to separate it. But we would also consider the value of that because, as we said, they're not expert. They should not dabble in issues that they don't have experts on. The second argument that uh, surfaced from the decisions is the acknowledgement or the recognition that scientific experimentation is part and parcel of understanding science. And therefore, the, the, the law must be able to carve out the space for experimentation to prove or to give evidence necessary for courts to make decisions. Because this has been a common issue in all the, uh, in, throughout the decisions in the CA and the Supreme Court. And I'll show you some experts in the way, excerpts later, in the way the justices tried to raise um, the questions to show that they are looking for certainty, but it's actually in ex in, through the experiment that we will be able to determine, find evidence to support the very safe point to address the questions that they are actually raising. So here the justices, in this case through Justice Leonard's concurring opinion, uh, has an acknowledgement that in order for them to make a legal reasoning, they have to understand the process of science, and that would involve testing and experiments. The more interesting part is really the hot top discussion of the Court of Appeals Justices. And uh, in uh, this particular document, what was done is to tally the different themes that uh, surfaced throughout the discussions. So what I have here are five uh, most common themes, and they are wrapped by frequency. So the first one, the top most common theme, or context of why all these questions from the justices came up in the hot top discussion, is really just echoes what was presented earlier. It's really about understanding what is PD, what is GMO, what does it involve? And then second relates to issues of public health and safety, Third is on food security. Fourth is the process of field trials and testing. And it's only five. The more uh, the more regulatory aspect, the more law-related issues is actually least among the uh, motivations in the questioning during the talk, which makes sense because perhaps they already know a bit of that. They can justices and their law clerks, their researchers can only can already find that out for themselves on their own using the materials that they have at the office. But issues about number ones to four are the ones that they would really need from the scientific experts. And how, how did we come up with these um, themes? No? These are just some of the illustrations from the text um, when we looked at the transcript of the hot talk discussions. So what we can see here is that the justices admit that they need information, that their knowledge as to the scientific aspect of the issue is not yet uh, that solid. So this is one justice. We, we, use it, we use codes for the justices' names, although from the, from, from the decision, uh, in the hut of the uh, transcript, you can trace that. But one justice saying, you have to educate me, I don't understand. And what they are trying, they have their own presumptions also. Am I correct? Is it this? That the eggplant has a specific DNA? So the science behind is something that they really want to know more about and understand. So again, do you look at what are their sources? So for this one, their sources are the scientific, the science, the experts that were brought by the respondents and the petitioners. And I will have a note on that because that also had an effect in the way we are able to convince justices. The other one, the other thing that uh, came out prominently is the issue of public health and safety of PT Talo and other GM products. So some of you, well, I think some scientists uh, found it funny or they found it embarrassing that some lawyers had to ask this, but 
this is among the key questions that justice is posed during the hot tub discussion. So if somebody eats pipi talong, what will happen to him or her? Mm -hmm. And there are also issues that reflect uh, the same concerns raised during the FGDs with uh, practitioner, law uh, practitioner lawyers, but links to cancer, links to other diseases. And this is not prompted by anything in, in the petitions, but actually questions that came from the justices themselves. And then there's that idiomatic expression of proof of the pudding is in the eating. So they're really concerned about the effect of uh, consumption. And again, this issue of absolute certainty, that it's safe for human consumption. So some of you might be familiar with the uh, the term that lawyers use in criminal procedure, the proof beyond reasonable doubt, right? It's like the standard before you are able to convict. But that only applies to criminal procedures where there will be deprivation of uh, life or freedom of a person who will be uh, held guilty. So that's like a tall standard. Any scintilla of doubt can, uh, can make the court acquit a person. So it's like coming from that level of, of that kind of perspective in making a decision that the justices want. So what's the absolute certainty? So it's not just certainty that they're looking for. It's absolute certainty in terms of the health and safety of the use of GM products. The third, in terms of food security benefits. So they're also interested not just in the effect on public health, individual health, but in the broader community impact of GMOs. So is there a increase in crop yield or would it threaten food security? So this uh, came about in discussions where there were concerns about how possible harm on um, other uh, crops that grow nearby and so on. So, but again, just looking at the perspective of where the justices are coming from, these are their key concerns. They're also not familiar with the process of field trial. So, some, I, I think there was uh, one article in uh, mainstream media that uh, made a comment that it seems like the justices are not studying because these are all in department in the DAOA, right? But they're not as familiar with it. And even if, I, I think, they read it, or some of their uh, researchers and doctors read it. But I think the uh, the great, the more, the more keen appreciation of of what those stages are in terms of testing have not yet sunk at that time to them. So they're trying to get a better grasp of it. So what do you get from field testing? They want to know the results. Is it? Would you be able to know if? Uh, it's safe to consume after the field testing. Of course, we know that that's not the stage for that. So they're very interested in that. In the question, their line of questioning now reflected that. And this is the least of the, their uh, concerns in terms of the question. So the regulatory aspect. So it's interesting because at the Court of Appeals level, where, where we're expecting them to focus more on the legal issues, they actually spent a lot of time on the hot tub discussion to address more of the substantive aspect. And that's also uh, somehow expected because that's their opportunity to question the expert witnesses. So the regulatory uh, implications dealt more on the who's supposed to regulate, are they regulating properly, what's the effect on the other crops. So just from looking at all these and now tracing, relating what uh, they raised in the questions to what were also discussed in the decisions, uh, we came up with four science-related themes that seem to recur throughout the different documents that we looked at. And the first one, I think, is uh, one that uh, was, I already mentioned earlier, and this reflected in many of the key words or terms that were repeatedly used in the documents. So there seems to be this quest for scientific certainty. Um, as I said, we could relate that to this idea of proof beyond reasonable doubt. And you can see that from the words used, is there a guarantee? They always look for that. What's the overall safety or absolute safety? It's like a hundred, they want a hundred percent assurance of what would be the effects of um, 
be it along in this case. And then just like what was uh, uh, heard from the FGDs with lawyers, there's also reliance on popular scientific literature. And what I mean by this is not the same as the CNN National Geographic and sci-fi movies that the uh, practitioner lawyers are uh, referred to, but from the hot top discussion, they, the justices uh, were more familiar with the Serenini study, the highly questioned Serenini study, because, well, one, pop, I use popular here, I, I'd rather use it with quotes, it was somehow popularized by the experts of the petitioners, because they packaged it in a way that would be easily understood and highly rate relatable to an ordinary individual. So if you eat this, that's why the questions of the justice is related to, so what happens if somebody eats a uh, law? So it's something that they can easily read, and that makes it popular even for highly esteemed lawyers or justices. <laughs> and that quite uh, leads us to a very important um, lesson about raising not just, I know our scientists are the experts, they know a lot, but having advocates, because people, the, the, the experts that were presented by petitioners were not just scientists who stayed in the laboratories, but they were advocates. They knew how to convince, they knew how to persuade, they knew how to package uh, their positions. So there was an easy reliance on that because of the accessibility of these types of information. And then it's also in the uh, decisions where we could see opposing claims and context about the safety of being the law. So a lot of scientists cried foul in the way the Court of Appeals referred to the BD, uh, BD corn tests. With BD the law is different from BD corn. The Supreme Court tried to correct that in its 2016 decision, but nonetheless, it gave a lot of basis in the discussions of the Court of Appeals regarding the harm that could be caused by the law. And then there's also the procedural aspect, the limited knowledge of the field trial process. And it's also largely because the field trial process is not part of a law. It's still part of an administrative rule or procedure. And when you are in law school, these administrative procedures are not really to don't constitute the bulk of your meetings or the topics for discussion. It's really the policy, the statutes. So there, in, in that respect, there is really an impact that we could get if the rules are translated into statutes. So what do we recommend based on what we saw from these documents? So this echoes a lot of what was also mentioned earlier, but uh, in general, it's really about increasing the access to credible scientific evidence. So this points us to the importance, and it would show to my fourth recommendation, if I can jump that, the need to invest in science communication, and not just science communication that is in the form of journal articles or uh, blogs in our own websites. So many of the advocates um, against GMO actually have people who are just doing advocacy. And I heard one a scientist saying, but they have people doing just that. We scientists, we have to be in our labs, we have to write our journal articles, and at the same time, go out and convince. And that's why we need more people. That's why we need to invest in groups and organizations and individuals who can serve as advocates. And then build the capacity of each profession, both the lawyers and the scientists, to communicate the perspectives and methods. And how can that happen? No? So what uh, what was mentioned earlier was uh, continuing legal education for lawyers, incorporation by technology, um, discussions in law schools, in law subjects. Um, we can actually have, we can actually explore joint trainings multi up to have a more interdisciplinary understanding. We've done that in other um, legal issues, for example, in um, human trafficking cases and trainings, instead of just training the lawyers or the prosecutors, instead of just training the NGO workers, we put them all together along with judges. 
along with the uh, prosecutors, along with the uh, social workers, including um, sometimes we have guests from, from the victims, from the families, and it's a joint training where everyone learns from each other and understands the perspective of each one. So there, there has to be a greater understanding that while law and science might be different, they, ha they can actually complement each other so we have a better understanding of issues such as the law. And if we want to promote interdisciplinarity and uh, uh, interdisciplinary understanding, then there should also be um, more platforms to do that that may not be in the form of formal trainings. So uh, in some uh, in some advocacies they just have like networking um, networking activities where you put together lawyers, you put together some other practitioners from other fields so that they are enriched in uh, their interactions. So that's another thing that might be considered. So especially since what we looked at are decisions and these are sanitized forms of communication because they all they have gone through a lot of editing, they follow particular forms. But because these are decisions, particularly those from the Supreme Court that are considered jurisprudence, and they, therefore they form part of the law of the land, the statements, the terminologies used there, and the perspectives that are uh, reflected there would actually be used as precedents and would shape future decisions of the courts. So that's basically what we got from the, from the content analysis, so thank you for listening. Thank you.